Everybody. Hello. Hey, I want to welcome everybody to our uh, regularly regularly scheduled member meeting, and this is obviously uh, an important one because not only we're we going to do a lot of uh, updates on what's going on around the organization and have a great outside speaker, but we're going to have uh, the beginning of our, our annual election process as well. So look forward to a good discussion over the next uh, hour and a half or so. And again, thanks for everybody for coming. I think we're going to get folks coming in the back. We just heard there was some, a couple accidents outside. So we're going to get going and, and start rolling through the program because as you see, we have a uh, pretty tight agenda. Um, after I give a few remarks, and I'm going to give you a quick tour on what's been going on around ACDIAC over the past few months. Um, we'll get a quick update around events from Marty Cummins. We'll have a website update um, from Mark. Um, we'll do the candidates forum, have folks come up and talk for a, a brief time each. Um, and then Margie Graves uh, will come. She's now the ACT president. She's the, she has been the deputy CIO at DHS, and now she actually is the deputy CIO for the government operating in OMB. So uh, she'll probably have a fascinating, I know she'll have a fascinating perspective on, on what's going on down there. And then, as always, we'll do some networking at the end. So we have a good, good solid agenda for everyone. And I'm going to just start out by, um, by uh, actually, you, you like to start on a, on a, on a, on a high note. I, I have to start out kind of on a somber note. I think uh, most people know that uh, Greg Ambrose passed away the other day. Um, Greg was a longtime active uh, member of, of ACT and a real good contributor to ACT IAC uh, and a real leader in government IT. So uh, very sad news for all of us. And we would just ask that everybody keep uh, Greg's family in their, in their thoughts and their prayers. Um, so moving on into, uh, into the regularly scheduled uh, uh, update on what's going on. So I, I'm going to break it into different, different quick categories. The first one is around major events, major activities. How many people in the room were at Igniting Innovation? Raise your hand. So uh, some number. I, I, what a great event. For those of you that didn't go, I would really encourage you to look at it for next year. Um, we had a, over 120 nominations. Uh, 40 were selected and put in a showcase, a petting zoo type environment. Uh, based on votes at the event, we got to eight finalists. The eight finalists did a shark tank up on stage, a lot of fun. And uh, one finalist was, was selected the overall winner, it was the My USCIS. And uh, just a really, really cool, fun event. So I'd encourage you to, to think about attending next year and think about nominating either a program you're working on or a program you know about. We've had some successful forums around customer experience and Fatara in the last few months, very well attended and really good feedback. On the people development front, uh, we've got 36 associates going through our class right now. It's a great class, really energized. Uh, our Voyagers are getting ready to graduate at MOC in a few weeks. Uh, the Partners Program is, is in, in mid-stride, a big offsite in June. Uh, you know, they'll lead to where their graduation in the fall. And there was a very well attended and high energy fellows meeting recently. The fellows, as you all know, are graduates of these programs that we try and keep, keep active with us. On the Small Business Alliance front, uh, there's been activities every single month. Um, the, the last, uh, in April, we had a networking mixer um, at LeapFrog. We had a straight talk uh, with a couple senior government leaders uh, on the 27th. We had another straight talk again today uh, where Keith Nakasoni from, uh, from FCC came. Some of you might have attended that. So that, that program is continuing to run for those of you interested, and they have a lot more events scheduled. You can learn more about them on the website. Uh, the COI transition, we're uh, you know, not quite nine months into that. We moved from SIGs to COIs this year. Uh, we have nine very active uh, transformed um, uh, COIs and one brand new one, uh, customer experience COI. We, we, we found that to be a, one that we wanted to establish. Uh, it's been a big lift to get that transformation done, and we are not done yet. Um, so we continue to need help in, in, in the leadership process there, and certainly in building out a, a platform for sharing and collaboration. There is a COI council that meets every couple of weeks that is coordinating and collaborating between the different groups. So that's an important step forward for them. Uh, the Institute for Innovation, many of you know that, that we, we have driven, driven many programs out of there. Igniting Innovation actually is championed by the Institute. Um, and there's also been a major life events project that got transitioned through there. The big push for them right now is the tra presidential transi transition papers. Uh, and we're well on the way to being ready to publish those. And for the first time, we're going to publish those earlier to really have a bigger influence on the campaigns. And also, we're coordinating with other key organizations like the Partnership for Public Service uh, on how we can have a bigger impact by coordinating some of the ideas that we all have. 
They're moving quickly into what's called the National Innovation Initiative. Um, we have a, a lead set up on that now. We're going to be announcing some, uh, some e efforts there. One will be a, a kind of a quick start guide for companies outside the Washington market or, or the federal market to give them a better understanding of how to enter the marketplace and how it operates. And we're doing some early planning around a couple events, one we might have here, one we might have in Silicon Valley. So we're, we're working on that. And then the in Institute is also looking at launching a, an innovation breakfast series, which would be another opportunity for people to come together and look at how to, how to turn our, our, our federal IT culture into a more innovative culture. So a lot happening with the Institute. And finally, with the Next US, that was the, the emer used to be called the Emerging Leaders. Now they've named themselves Next US. They have a new 40, or a renewed, I should say, because some continued, but, but a, a new 40 person board, 25 uh, uh, up and coming government, uh, 24 up and coming industry leaders, and 16 up and coming government leaders that are really uh, coming up with a program for this year. They've had two, uh, 200 or more active members at, at various events, and uh, they're looking to really energize that part of the community. And we are looking as a leadership now how to plug them into all that we do so we can get that millennium, millennial perspective in all the activities that we have. So that's a very quick kind of five minute or less tour, tons going on. You'll hear more about the website in a few minutes, but the website will give you a lot more information on what's happening. I'd ask before Marty comes up or as he comes up, I'd ask you just a, one, a real favor for everybody here. We, we've been talking about uh, at the ACT and NIAC uh, leadership levels, how do we get the message out about ACT and NIAC? and the great work we're doing, how we're different than a lot of the organizations around town, our real push for collaborative uh, interaction with government and industry and advancing government together. And, and I'm really making a plea to this group and pretty much every group I talk to that you are our brand. So when you're out talking to friends in the community, the more you can talk about what act IAC is, the more that's better for the organization, the more people we can engage. So that's really my ask to, to promote what we're doing here. And I think it's a really fascinating and unique uh, time for our, our, our industry and, uh, and our marketplace. And we can all continue to help with the standing of this organization. With that, I'm going to move into, uh, oh, I, I want to welcome uh, some of our new companies. Uh, we continue to add members. Um, is there anybody from one of these companies that, that's in the room right now? Could you st just stand and introduce yourself, please, to the group? <laughs> Welcome. Good. I give a hand for our two new members that are in the room. And, and now that you have facial recognition on them, you can learn more about them when we network later on. Okay. But well, congratulations and welcome to all of our new members. Uh, I think we, we, uh, quick on the update uh, on the coming events, Marty's going to talk about management of change. Uh, there is a small business growth symposium. We have a small business alliance that does smaller programs. This one's a half day session for those of you that are interested. Uh, that's something worth checking out. And the volunteer corps has an upcoming event in June as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Marty now on the, on the major events update. Thanks, Ted. Yes. these. Uh Event updates are specific to MOC and ELC. And Management of Change, May 22nd to the 24th at a great venue, the uh, Cambridge uh, Hyatt. If you've never been there, it's a great beachfront, great golf course, the facilities are wonderful. Um, we're under the great leadership this year of Richard McKinney and Hillary Gazzola. They've done an outstanding job with our team. And uh, as you see, the theme is the IT at Crossroads, Managing Risk Through Transformation. This is an executive level conference. The uh, ratio between uh, industry and government is one to three, which is outstanding. You see some of the topic areas there. I won't read them all to you, but uh, I will point out the one, disruptions to the government environment. That may happen in November or sometime around there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Great list of speakers already confirmed, Denise Turner-Roth, the GSA Administrator, Tony Scott, the CIO of the United States, uh, and you see representation from all of our major uh, agencies. So tomorrow there is a, um, a Twitter chat, uh, so please uh, take that down and join us, join us from 11.30 to 12.00. Uh, and this is where I have to put in the plug to please register for MOC. It is an outstanding conference, especially if you've never been there. Lots of changes. Um, we had great attendance last year. 
because of some changes that were made the year before, last year, and now it's just getting better and better. So please join us. The Executive Leadership Conference, ELC, Colonial Williamsburg, one of my favorite venues, October 23rd to the 25th. Please put that on your calendar. Under the leadership of David Bray, Teresa Bozzelli, uh, and the theme there is an understatement. Uh, change agents, delivering results different, differently and better. Uh, this is a larger conference, still an executive level conference, 850 attendees. And registration will be in July, but Keisha tells me probably before, but uh, please put that on your calendar. Uh, again, some great topic areas. And that's ELC in Colonial Williamsburg. Please come see us. It's a great conference. Any questions? We're not going to take questions. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we are going to keep the program rolling. We're, Mark's going to come up. You know, I, I, wanna, I, I do want to congratulate Mark and the team because the undertaking they had to do to update this, this website and actually the, the, the look and feel and the functionality is just such a big upgrade. So Mark's going to share more about what we're doing with the website. Come on up, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, we're going to focus on it. I really do want to get one specific feature that we have, which is our digest. Uh, we just implemented it a couple of weeks ago. We've been testing it internally with select members. I'm asking everybody to please sign up for the digest. And what the digest is, is either a daily or a weekly email, depending how you sign up for it, that'll tell you what's been added to the website in the groups you belong to or in areas of interest you've selected. So you'll now get a proactive notification of new content, new activities, things that are happening on the website. Uh, it'll make it a lot easier for you to get to it, and it's got direct links to the content. Uh, to sign up, it, uh, it's really the easiest way is to go on the website, on the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a box that says My Act IAC. Click on it, that'll take you to your personal dashboard. You'll see the box that's at the top of this screen, which explains you how to sign up for the Digest. But the important thing is there's a little button over that says uh, Digest, My Digest Options or something. Uh, just click on that and you'll see the box that's at the bottom that says Daily or Weekly Digest. That's all you have to do. The second part of it is to sign up for your interests in your profile, and that, then you'll receive anything that's tagged with that particular interest. The digest looks like this. there's two pieces to it. The top part has content and groups that you belong to. You can see this was a pretty active day. If there's more than 10 items, there'll be a link that says click here to see more. The bottom part will have new, new content that's been posted that's specific to interests you selected. So you may not belong to a particular community of interest or a particular group, or there may just be something that's kind of out there that's, that's of interest to you. This way you'll find out about it without having to go into the site every day and check into it. There's some information here. There's tutorials. We, we have now have uh, video tutorials. We're going to be putting more and more on. Uh, they're on the site. My contact information is at the bottom. I'll be around afterwards. Just come see me if you have any questions on this feature. But I think it's something you should all sign up for as quickly as you can if you're not already signed up. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, a lot of progress on that. And we continue to make it more user friendly and more functional. All right, we're going to move into the candidates forum now, the kind of the, the second and really the most meaty topic in the, in the middle of the, the program before we get to, to Margie at the end. Um, you know, just to give you a quick uh, overview of what the, what the process is for those of you that don't know, um, a nominating committee, and this process, by the way, is run by the executive vice chair. That's Dave McClure. Uh, Dave is out of the country right now, so, um, so I'll be uh, discussing this uh, for him. Um, but the nominating committee was appointed. Uh, there were six um, outside members of the nominating committee, and then the immediate past chair, the current chair, and the executive vice chair sit on the nominating committee. And uh, Ken, Ken uh, Allen also sits on the committee, particularly in an advisory role. We solicited nominations from the entire organization. Um, this year, we only got 10 nominations. Um, so as we go forward, we look for great nominations. Um, what we did as, as a committee was we kind of reviewed ourselves what the priorities were for the organization, what the challenges and opportunities were, to make sure we understood what the characteristics we really, really had to have in the, in the nominees. 
We vetted the nominees that we got. We also asked, the, the reason why we asked for six outsiders to, to sit on the committee is to get their ideas on folks in our community that would really meet those attributes and really help us as an organization. So some names were added and vetted and then added there. And we got a final slate, and that slate was published to the membership. Um, there was an opportunity for petitions uh, to get other people added to that list. Um, there were no, no ads for the vice chairs or for the finance chair. There was an ad for the executive vice chair. So Mitzi's gonna be presenting today. Um, and uh, so it, I think it's a very healthy part of the process that we get to put a nominating committee together, we solicit nominations, we gather names, and if at the end of the day that we wanna add somebody because the membership supports that person, then it's great. So that, that's where we are. You're gonna hear from all the candidates uh, uh, tonight. And then once we, uh, once we uh, get done today, uh, voting will open tomorrow. It'll run through the, uh, through the following Friday and we will be announcing your new board uh, at, at Management of Change. So for those of you that are there, you'll get the first preview. For those of you that are not, you're gonna have to follow online. Um, just as a reminder, um, each company gets one vote. Um, there is a list of voting members. If you're not sure if you're a voting member, you can check with one of the staff here or you can, you can check in later on. Uh, but each company only gets one vote. Um, and as I said, the voting happens over that, that one week period. If there's multiple people in the company with, with, it, with uh, ideas, then we suggest that you get together and compare notes and come up with what makes sense. Um, and if you got more information, um, Don, is, where is Don here? Where's Don? Okay, so, so Don's here. Uh, and, and, and so Don will be around uh, for questions if you have them later on. All right, so with that, we're gonna move into the, uh, we're gonna start with the, uh, the vice chairs at large. Um, we have four open, open uh, seats, so to speak. Uh, and we have uh, seven candidates uh, that are gonna be running. And we're just gonna take them in alphabetical order. And the way we've structured this is, the candidate gets three minutes. I think uh, Nikolai's gonna help, help uh, officiate the time. Um, and we're gonna start with, uh, with Susie Adams. Susie is the CTO at Microsoft Federal. And Susie, if you can come on up and, and uh, share your ideas with the group, that'd be great. Yeah, you, no, <laughs> see, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. I think there's sometimes a good thing with having your last name begin with an A, and then there's a bad time to have your last name begin with an A. <laughs> so I look at Kathy down there. Um, so I'm Susie Adams. I'm currently the CTO for Microsoft Federal. I've been there about 17 years, uh, and I'm super excited to be here. I've been participating in IAC uh, types of events uh, for years, uh, and also participating in multiple working groups throughout the years, helping write papers on a variety of different topics. Uh, and when they told me I had three minutes to speak, I thought, well, I'm not sure I know everybody in the room, so maybe I should spend just a little bit of time uh, updating you on my background so you know a little bit more about me. I actually uh, began my career 30 years ago here in the Washington, D.C. area. I actually grew up in Manassas. My father worked for IBM. And I attended George Mason University, where I actually played uh, Division I basketball. Uh, we were not very good, I'll just say that, um, <laughs> at all. First year Division I. Um, and I graduated with an information systems degree out of the business school. And from there, uh, when I began my career, I immediately started, of course, working for a, a consulting firm here that was supporting the Navy. Um, it, Tidewater Consultants, many of you may know Tidewater. Uh, they were actually purchased, I believe, uh, some time ago. And then from there, I moved uh, to DynCorp, Booz Allen, and Hamilton. Uh, and my role really in these organizations was an application developer in the, the programming language du jour. So whatever that was, from Clipper C assembly, uh, was an Oracle DBA. Um, and then uh, actually, before I joined Microsoft, it, shortly before, it was the very first time I actually started uh, writing code in any Microsoft. Uh, languages, so I was actually anything but Microsoft before joining Microsoft, which was a, an interesting experience. Um, and then from there, uh, and most of that time, I was supporting the federal government. So from Department of Ed Education to DOD, Department of Homeland Security, um, State Department, I mean, pretty much around the board, uh, just helping federal agencies try to solve some of their challenges. And I have to tell you that my experiences were very interesting. I mean, I spent two years writing an application for the Navy that was never deployed. <laughs> I uh, worked with, uh, in my days at Microsoft, I worked with uh, some folks developing or trying to automate the OMB 300 process just to learn that while everybody was supposed to be web ser uh, service enabled, uh, the, the IT shops wouldn't allow web services. You had to write cron jobs on Unix boxes to get to accept data. And so one of the things I'm super passionate about is that 
you know, as, as with this, the current trend that we're in with all this innovation coming out, and you know, I get to talk about it all day long, and I get to see my uh, commercial colleagues be able to actually implement this very quickly inside commercial organizations, and it's super frustrating to sit and talk with federal agencies who are struggling, who want to do the right thing, and industry's trying to help them, and they just can't get there. Right? And it's, you know, some of this is policy, but I think, you know, I'm excited that I've been nominated uh, to run for the vice chair at large. Um, excited to, to participate and, and actually uh, add, uh, hopefully at a much higher level uh, than, I've, than I've done before by just attending conferences and helping participate in white papers. So thank you very much. Okay. When we start the act Dyke basketball team, Susie, I want you on the team. There you go. All right, our next, uh, our next candidate is Kathy Conrad. She's the Director of Digital Government at Accenture. Thank you, Ted. As you might be able to guess, I've never played basketball. <laughs> I'd be way worse. So thank you so much. I'm really honored to have the chance to run uh, for the vice chair at large position. I've been very active in act IAC for probably about 10 years. And I'd bring to the board a very diverse, kind of well-rounded perspective on the value that act IAC brings into the federal community, to, the, federal cust to our, the customers that the government serves, and to industry, and as Susie said, trying to be a really effective, good partner uh, to government. I've uh, been a leader in a small business and participated at the SIG, or now community of interest level. Um, I started out getting um, sort of recruited to head up an ethics task force at a time many, many years ago when the pendulum was really starting to swing. And I think a lot of us were really concerned that it would swing too far. And it was a great um, opportunity for me to get to know colleagues across government in an arena that I'm not an attorney, I was not an ethics expert. But what I think I'm pretty good at doing is listening to different people and being a good collaborator and good facilitator and helping to explain in kind of plain language issues that are really important to government. Through that experience, um, I, I really saw firsthand the value of act IAC. And so I raised my hand and like many of you, uh, upped my participation and since then have been a vice chair and an industry co-chair of ELC um, last year, I got drafted kind of at the last minute when Sonny Hashmi um, decided to move to industry to be the government chair of management of change. I've uh, been involved with the Innovator Circle and the Executive Advisory Committee for act -IAC. So I've really seen act -IAC from many, many dimensions, small business, large business, and then most recently, prior to joining Accenture, I served in an SES position at the GSA. So I really see the need for the kind of collaboration, professional development, and sort of independent, neutral, substantive input that we provide government in helping government work better. I think there are three issues that we need to continue really working on. One is increasing collaboration and participation so that it's not just the IT community talking to itself. We need to engage with the business community, with the CFO community, and with the acquisition community. And we've made a lot of strides in those arenas in recent years, but I think there's more we can do. We also need to really focus on people. As Ted said, people, people are the heart and soul of act -IAC. In the last two months, I recruited one of my colleagues at Accenture who had not even really heard of act -IAC to participate in a really high, high visibility, high impact project because he had the right substantive expertise. And I saw him the other day and he said, it's been one of the most valuable things he's ever done and he'll continue to do that. And then I did the same thing with a government colleague. And then finally, I think we need uh, to really make sure that we continue to add value during this time of transition so that we remain relevant and important. Thank you. All right, our next candidate in alphabetical order is Marty Cummins. Marty's the CEO and incumbent on our board right now of Integrated Support Systems. Thank you, Ted. Um, as he said, I'm Marty Cummings and I am the CEO of Integrated Support Systems, Inc. And I believe that I am the only incumbent on the slate today. And 
when I stood here two years ago talking to you, I was telling you about my long history in ACT IAC and and uh, my participation in the Partners Program and chaired a Voyagers class. The Voyagers class that created Voyagers Got Talent. And I also talked with you about the desire to serve more. And so the past two years on the EC has afforded me an excellent opportunity to do just that. So my primary role on the Executive Committee is responsible for conferences and conference strategy. Conferences are the lifeblood of this organization. And the conference world is changing, and we've got to keep up with that change. So we started a conference strategy working group. Now this is an all-star team of people in our business, both industry and government, and they are dissecting every aspect of our conferences and updating our format and our approach to make them more dynamic, innovative, and more profitable. And I am very proud of the work that has been done thus far, and we are on track to submit a final report to the annual EC committee in June. I've also been responsible for recruiting chairs and vice chairs for our major conferences, especially MOC and DELC. And believe me when I say this is no easy task. And it's even harder to get the right people in these positions these executives have the awesome responsibility of managing and coordinating teams of up to 50 volunteers. And that's what it takes to put on a significant conference. But with MOC right around the corner, as I look at Hillary, I am confident that if you come join us, you will be impressed with the quality of the content and the execution of our plan. So while I am thrilled about what we have accomplished over the last two years, I would like the opportunity to continue that work, to provide the continuity that is so important at a crucial time in this organization's history. So in closing, I'll just say, I'm a CEO, a Marine, an Eagle Scout, a dad of three, a grandfather of four. I have a major milestone birthday the end of this month. And what does that mean? That means I'm not a millennial. <laughs> but what it also means is I can keep up with those millennials. I am hardworking and I am prepared to support the mission of ACT IAC. So I'm also prepared to reach out to those millennials, bring them into this organization because they truly are the future of this association. So, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity for the last two years. I'm asking for two more years, asking for your vote. I won't let you down. Thank you very much. So what I heard was Marty's going to have a big 40th birthday party this year. That's really cool, Marty. Pretty young to be a granddad, you know. All right, our next candidate is Jackie Everett. Jackie's the VP and Area Sales Lead for Civilian at HP Enterprise. Thanks, Ted. Don't start the clock yet. Basketball. They told me it was a non-contact sport. I didn't quite understand that. <laughs> All right. Let me get ready here. So my name is Jackie Everett, and I'm with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to stand before you. I'm interested and understand the critical importance um, of this election and that we need our best possible candidates to be on this board. Um, I think my qualifications and experience align me with the right um, qualifications to be here, and I appreciate this opportunity to share with you what I feel are my strengths and capabilities to demonstrate my readiness for this position. My experience uh, is 30 years in this industry, I'm a millennial, and uh, I've worked for large business, medium size, and small businesses. And my government know-how is I have supported all the U.S. government, and um, I've managed and delivered programs and worked along the side of our government partners. And my uh, IAC community uh, insights is that I'm a fellow partner, class of 2000, whoo, and um, I've also been involved in many of the management of change and ELC planning committees and have served as the vice chair of the acquisition management SIG when it was a startup. And I'm uh, proud to say today that it's still going as a community of interest today and it's still benefiting both government and industry today. 
And I also am a strong advocate of this um, association. Uh, the value of the Leadership Development Education Program is phenomenal. I've been paying it forward with supporting my own people in their active engagement in this association. Small business is really critical and I'm a big supporter and I will listen and advocate for all of our members in this category to help them grow and make sure that they have a big participation in our organization. Association appreciation. Um, I've been a board member with other associations and with Guy Tech and I've been involved with FCA and, and this organization and I understand the importance of the financial health of this of, of an organization. So I think my professional experience here in managing uh, large budgets and effect effectively driving revenue into my organization will ensure our priorities, outcomes are measurable and sustainable for the future. I've learned the importance of a value of a vibrant and supported organization. And it is critical that we continue our relevance needed to deliver our association's unique value proposition. And um, I know that uh, the voice of all, I know it's really important that we work side by side with all members and ensure our voice is heard and that all of our programs and processes are understood. And I have a vast network, I have a big network. Many of you know that I've been in the community for a long time and it's uh, large and in depth and I plan to bring that here when we need to. And I will be jumping in with both feet. I will provide immediate value, I've been asking and listening and reading to make sure that I understand the priorities and challenges that lie ahead because we're going to have a lot coming up here in the next couple years and we need to make sure that um, you have some really steady and reliable partners on this board and I, and I will be one of those, I promise you that. And I'm very team spirited. Uh, most of you <coughs> excuse me, know me as far as being a very good collaborator, I'm very transparent in my interactions. and. Um, I will work collaboratively with all my colleagues in this, in this position. I care very deeply about the value that we gain in this association. It's very important. It's value to you, the company, and the government should set our priorities. So I'm ready to provide um, you the executive level leadership. I hope I can count on you with your vote. My name is Jackie Everett and thank you for this opportunity. All right, our next candidate uh, is Sonny Hashmi. Sonny's the Managing Director of Global Government for Box. My fellow Americans, <laughs> today I'm here to announce my candidacy for President of the United States. No. <laughs> I figure everybody else is doing it, I should do it too. Um, Thank you for the opportunity for being here today. Thank you for the nomination. I'm very honored. Um, when I first joined GSA about six years ago now, the first advice uh, that Casey Coleman, my boss, um, uh, gave me was to join act -IAC. And it's been one of the most uh, uh, valuable pieces of advice that I've ever received because this community has allowed me to grow, learn, connect. Uh, I've been able to work with many of you uh, in this room today through my uh, career at GSA and then since, as well as many people who are not in this room. Uh, by way of background, interestingly, uh, one of the things I cherish about my background is I've always been at the intersection of technology and public service. And uh, probably the only candidate who's uh, worked in startups, started a couple of failed startups myself, worked in Fortune 5 companies, federal government, state and local government, and now, of course, going back to the Silicon Valley environment. Uh, while that is interesting and unique, uh, I believe that the perspective that that provides me is that um, each of these communities that typically doesn't talk to each other does have a very powerful, impactful, and uh, interesting perspective. And uh, the, the job of an organization like this should be to bring those perspectives together. So one of the areas that I'll be focusing on if I get your vote is to do exactly that. Uh, I think uh, as for this organization to grow and thrive and for the federal community at large to become uh, powerful and continue to be viable uh, as business partners as we go forward into uh, into the next administration and into the, into the technology era that we're moving into, we have to bring those perspectives together, listen with an open ear, and actually find onboarding, onboarding pathways for new and emerging companies to join this community, as well as for existing um, uh, mature and established players to find those uh, matchmaking opportunities. So one of the things that I'm engaged in right now is the National, uh, National Innovation uh, Initiative. I've been with ACTIAC and uh, supported many initiatives as as well as uh, including conference uh, planning, um, uh, part of the, uh, done, done a lot of work uh, in the Institute of Innovation. So I've been very honored to be part of this community for a long time. Um, if, if I get your vote, my focus is going to be uh, to bring those, uh, those communities together. Uh, I believe that there's a great opportunity for us to set the standard and, and be, the, be the hub for um, uh, both 
new and emerging technology processes, uh, ideas, and, and companies from all the central centers of innovation across the country and to bring those best practices and innovation to serve the American people here in D.C. as well as in government sectors beyond. So with that, I'm going to ask you for your vote. Uh, I, I work hard at everything I do. I don't make a commitment that I don't plan to keep. Uh, I, I, I would appreciate if you give me the chance to do so, and I'm very excited to be part of this organization. Thank you. The biggest reaction of the day is when Sonny announced his candidacy for president. There you go. I think that tells you, well, I won't say anything. Uh, so our next candidate is Yogesh Khanna. Yogesh is the CTO at CSRA. Well, I looked at the slate a couple of days ago. I've been on, on travel for about a week and a half. And when I seriously started looking at it, I was like, wow, this is a phenomenal slate of candidates. Uh, so I'm, I'm truly honored to, to be among uh, this group. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a local product. I actually graduated uh, from high school in Fairfax County. I went to George Marshall High School, believe it or not, just around the corner for a couple of years. Uh, graduated from Virginia Tech in electrical engineering. Uh, went on to do a master's degree in systems engineering. And that might have been the best degree or best uh, two years uh, that I spent. Um, everything we do in our environment is all about systems, right? It's never about technology alone. Um, and I've had a wonderful career so far. I've worked with uh, a, a large telecom carrier, um, spent many years in GTE, uh, worked for two or three years, two and a half years with uh, MITRE. So I got a pretty interesting perspective on uh, CETA uh, and how the government operates on the other side of the fence. Uh, worked for a multinational company, CSC, you guys have all heard of them. Uh, and very acutely aware of uh, the challenges of bringing commercial technology into the uh, federal government environment. Um, did a startup. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm back working because I didn't hit a home run. <laughs> um, did not do a successful IPO, but uh, launched a small company uh, called Mobile Helix. Uh, um, was a CEO, and I tell you, no degrees in the world can actually give you that kind of experience. Uh, and, and learning how to fail uh, and taking care of your employees at the same time and, and you know, getting a soft landing um, is a different experience. And I was able to parlay that and bring that back into uh, government contracting, uh, working uh, for CSC for about six, seven years. And now we're actually a five and a half billion dollar startup, which is CSRA, combination of the public sector of CSC, merged with uh, SRA International. So that gives you the sort of diverse perspective that I will bring uh, to the table. Uh, life is all about perspectives. Um, CS, CS, CSRA is very much a, a service provider. Uh, we don't make any products. We don't have any technology of our own. We rely, our lifeblood, if you will, is, is the partner ecosystem. Um, so my job today is really working very closely with our small vendor uh, uh, partners, technology vendor partners, small businesses, uh, and other folks that sort of come together to bring that systems engineering approach to, to solutions. And I think part of what I'll do is bring that technology focus to the table and, and the influence of the entire ecosystem that we're building around our partners and bring a lot of folks to join ACT-IAC. I've had uh, a lot of contributions in, in um, uh, various groups, including ACT-IAC, but more importantly in, in leadership roles at Tech America. I've been on the board of directors there. Um, I've, uh, I sit on uh, the uh, advisory board at Louisiana Tech University uh, on their College of Engineering and Science. So I have an academic angle there in terms of what the next generation workforce needs to uh, be and how we embrace them into our workforce. Uh, and I've, I've worked extensively at PSC and, and also at um, NBTC. So those perspectives are what I expect to bring and I ask your vote to give me the opportunity to serve. Thank you. And our final candidate, again in alphabetical order, for uh, Vice Chair at Large is Sundar Vadianathan. Sundar, Sundar is a co-founder and CEO of Carson Solutions. I'm sorry. Come on, Sundar. Thank you, Dan. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right. So um, I'm really honored to be uh, considered for the IAC Executive Committee. And uh, we have a great lineup of uh, uh, nominees for this uh, committee. And I'm really proud to be part of them. Um, but I do have the unique privilege of being only small business owner running for this role. And uh, that being said, um, I cannot go wrong with any of you guys, any of us, okay? 
And so let me use my allotted three minutes of time to highlight the, you know, give you the top three highlights of my candidacy, okay? The first one, um, I'll be a leading voice for small business. Um, as the founder and CEO of Carson Solutions, I will bring the entrepreneurial spirit and energy to ACTAIAC. And um, I have the, my experience in running Carson Solutions for the last six years helped me understand the small business challenges, um, especially in an in a ever com uh, increasingly competitive marketplace. And I will not only bring this, uh, in my experience and insights, but also make sure that the viewpoint of small business is well represented within ACTAIAC. And I look forward to being very active with the Small Business Alliance, uh, uh, the very, uh, very much important organization within um, ACTAIAC. The second is my long-term track record within uh, ACTAIAC. Um, I'm really uh, uh, thankful to the entire ACTAIAC community for being there with me throughout my entire professional career. Um, I started uh, being uh, uh, my journey with ACTAIAC uh, through my membership in Enterprise Architecture SIG in, way back in 2004. And then I then went on to become the co-chair of uh, Best Practices Subcommittee within Collaboration and Transformation SIG. And then I co-chaired uh, um, the CX for Breakfast event as part of one of the MOC uh, Management of Change Conference. I graduated from the Partners Program in 2010, and I, I served as the Vice Chair and the Industry Chair for the Partners Program in the last two years. And the relationship and the bonds we form here in this community are, ha can have a lasting impact and uh, it can bring real benefits to all the participating members. The last one is I will be a committed ambassador for ACTAIAC. There has been a real, uh, we have a real challenge in bringing new people like, uh, you know, Marty talked about bringing millennials. So we have this challenge in bringing new people as part of ACTAIAC. And I strongly believe that ACTAIAC provides a uh, true platform for long-term sustained collaborations, um, and that can bring values to both industry and government. And I would, I would, I'm committed to take that message loud and clear. And uh, um, there is no better way to, you know, communicating the benefits that we have received to other members to increase the participation. And I promise you that I will be a committed um, ambassador for ACTAIAC, and I will reach out to my extended network of small business owners and other government leaders to bring them on board to participate in ACTAX. So with that, I will wrap up my speech, and I thank you for the opportunity to stand before you, and I humbly ask for your vote, and I, together we will embark on a journey to take ACTAX to new heights. Thank you. That's an upbeat message, Sundar, thank you. Hey, I, I gotta say, that's a great set of candidates. I mean, the, the nominating committee, I think, worked really hard, and I, those were great presentations from all seven. I, I, I don't know how people will vote between them. Um, I really wish them the best of luck. One more round of applause for all seven candidates. All right, we have uh, one candidate for uh, the Vice Chair for Finance. I think many of you know that Bob Suda is, um, has termed out. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think, I think, I think uh, Bob, Bob is either <laughs> run away or he's termed out. And so we need a new Vice Chair for Finance. And the nominating committee has, uh, has asked Paul Strasser to run in that, in that, for that position. Paul is a current uh, IAC board member. He's also the CEO of uh, Project Performance Corporation. And uh, he's, he's actually on business travel right now. He wanted to be here to say a few words to you, but he is our, our nominating committee's candidate for this, this position. So moving on to the, uh, oh, there's, there's Paul's picture, oops. Um, <laughs> I gotta tell Paul, I had your picture up there. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, finally, the, you know, the, the executive vice chair role uh, uh, position, as we said, we, we do have two candidates, um, and again, in alphabetical order. Uh, the first one uh, that will talk to us today is Teresa Bzelli. Teresa is the president of Sapient Government Services. Thank you. I didn't, I, I didn't get the memo to sit in the front like... Uh, everybody else. So I'm not in basketball either. So, so I am Teresa Bazzelli and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and the nominating committee for considering me for the position of Executive Chair. 
As background, I am the president of Sapient Government Services, and in that role I lead two verticals of our industry alignment. I lead the public sector business and I lead our health practice, which includes both government and commercial clients. I'm also senior vice president of our affiliate and parent called Publicis.Sapient, uh, which brings together transfer global leadership and transformation and digital engagement. I've dedicated, uh, as many of the speakers, all of my career to technology in public sector, uh, starting as a programmer, Susie, uh, on the space shuttle program, uh, and then a very long tenure at Booz Allen and a partner there for over five years. But between my role at Booz Allen and Sapient Government Services, I also started a small business uh, and grew uh, an organization from two people to a successful entity that was spun off. Uh, so I've seen both sides of the equation of the small and large business relationship. I've had many opportunities of leadership uh, that this industry has provided. Uh, I, my, my other job this week is uh, we're writing and scripting and producing the Children's Inn Gala on Saturday. See you there. So, but I've done that for six years, and it's a great, great leadership opportunity. Also, my leadership in our industry has been recognized uh, Fed 100 winner uh, act or uh, firm and also uh, the um, FCA recognition as well. Uh, also, working beyond our industry, uh, being recognized with the Consulting Magazine Top 25 uh, and the Washington Business Journal Women Who Mean Business. I think what this brings to the organization here is a diversity of experience and a track record of being able to handle some very complex organizations that have incredible reach. But the one thing that's been kind of consistent is ACT IAC has always been a thread through my career, like over half of my career. And what struck me first, and something that I really try to get people who are new to understand, it's a great place to, it's a place where I first saw the passion and the depth of talent that we have in our industry. It's the first time I truly saw an authentic partnership between government and industry. And when I can talk about anything and get people excited, that's really, it, it's what really makes a difference. And I want to continue to give back to this organization. Um, I am the um, industry chair for ELC this year and excited about doing that. I, will, I want to see everyone here, by the way. I'll be taking names. Uh, what my commitment to you in this role is to really accelerate and take advantage of this opportunity and the transition of government to create a partnership that accelerates based on innovation at speed and scale. In order to do that, we have to look at a diversity and sources of innovation from places that we may not even found yet, from thought leaders globally, commercial entities, ourselves, and unleashing that power, the wisdom of the people who have been before us, and unleashing in the creativity of our millennials. It's important. And I think ACTI is the only one who can really seize that opportunity of transition in a way that creates that authentic partnership. I want to be part of the foundation of how we do that and the excitement around it, capitalizing on really what's gone before and delivering in new ways. While the opportunities that we face of change and innovation and all of the constraints are not new, the change that's coming with the political cycle is new and we only get to seize this opportunity every four or eight years. And that's what I really want ACT IAC to do and I want to be able to lead in that, that process and that innovation. So I look for your, would appreciate your vote of confidence in, uh, in the vision that we want to have. So thank you for your time. And uh, we'll hand it off to the next consideration. Our second candidate for the executive vice chair is Mitzi Mead. Mitzi, Mitzi is a current board member and also the co-founder of Excella Consulting. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm the last speaker, yay. Okay. Good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mitzi Mead. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Excella Consulting. As the owner of a small business, I know the challenges these businesses face daily. Prior to starting Excella, 
I held senior positions at large companies in both product and services sectors. So I have a broad understanding of the challenges faced by our members in this marketplace. I'm currently an EC member and have worked hard for the past four years improving the professional development programs. I'm proud of my accomplishments and I leave these programs stronger than ever. Additionally, I've been volunteering for 20 years, I know I don't look it, <laughs> and I am an IAC Fellow. My tenure as an EC member gives me comprehensive knowledge of IAC's organization, its responsibilities, and its challenges. My professional background, experience on the board, and my passion for this association make me uniquely qualified to become the next Executive Vice Chair. I believe that over the last several years, IAC has been transformed into the premier association for thought leadership in the federal IT marketplace. This is of great value to our government colleagues, and we need to ensure that it continues. However, I feel we need to improve the value that we provide to you, our industry members. I believe we must, must be equally responsive to both of our stakeholders, government and industry, in order to remain relevant. If elected, I will ensure that the expectations of our paying membership are met while protecting our value to government. I feel that the question, how does this benefit our stakeholders, must be answered before any new endeavors, and we must focus on customer experience. Additionally, I would place more emphasis within IAC on business opportunities. As a business owner, I understand that the key reason that companies join IAC is to utilize the benefits of this association to grow their federal revenues. It's pretty simple. Therefore, we need to talk openly about this and establish more business-focused events that are mutually beneficial to government and, and industry and that adhere to IAC's high ethical standards. In closing, IAC needs an executive vice chair who understands industry's expectations and who will lead the executive committee in that direction. A vote for me will help increase the value of this organization to you. Please vote for me. Thank you very much. So none of us in this room are politicians, thank goodness. And all of us here are business leaders and I wanna congratulate both Mitzi and Teresa for giving really good presentations here. Um, I think it's always a little uncomfortable to talk about yourself and I think they both did a great job. So, um, so voting was going to begin, uh, I guess, um, somebody tell me tomorrow, Ken? Tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, you now have your, uh, your set of candidates. Well, let, let me one more round of applause, by the way, for Mitzi and for Teresa. You now have your set of candidates for, uh, for this, this coming year's um, uh, elected officers. Um, with that, I hope, I think Margie's, I see Margie in the back, this is great, she made it out of DC. <laughs> this is wonderful. Um, really, I, I have the, the privilege and the honor to introduce Margie. I, I'm not gonna go through her whole bio. I'm, I'm gonna just start with the last year where she's been the ACT president and just an absolute fa fabulous partner uh, you know, with, with IAC and done a great job co-leading all the events and the activities we have here. She had a huge job at, at DHS, uh, Deputy CIO there, um, and it was so huge that uh, they asked her to take on a bigger job <laughs> as the uh, Deputy CIO of the government, and she, uh, she offered to come out and spend a few minutes with us this evening talking about kind of her experiences, certainly over the last month, but even probably before that. So let's welcome Margie to the stage. I got the knee go. and I'm, I'm working on getting that fixed. <laughs> and of course I'm very short so this always helps. Okay. I'm actually the last speaker. <laughs> so I'm the one that's standing between you and cocktails so that's always a, a, a very good uh, place to be I'm sure. Uh, those of you who understand Myers-Briggs, I'm going to state for the record right now that I'm an ENFP, 
And what that means is I'm always asking what's next, what's next, what's next, keep the ball rolling. Uh, but every once in a while, it's nice to take a breath, step back, and, and look over the last year and say, what have we actually accomplished as a team? Uh, I'm so incredibly honored to be associated with this organization. And uh, I believe in the last year, I've been able to observe from this particular position, and now in the last month at OMB, how the kinds of products and thought leadership and input that comes out of this organization actually weaves its way into what turns, turns into uh, the, the primary agenda. Uh, and I can't thank you enough for your volunteerism, for the fact that you come to the table, that you bring your big ideas, that you help us understand uh, diverse perspectives, and that we get ultimately out of that a better product, uh, whether it's legislation, whether it's policy, whether it's uh, implementation guidance, and especially uh, because I just left the agency side of the equation. I want to thank uh, my government colleagues in the room because, uh, you know, it is really, really difficult to run a, a huge operation on a daily basis and then uh, also be aware and cognizant of all of the new things that are coming down the path and trying to constantly innovate and change. We're all here because we have the common goal of good government. Whether you're on the industry side or whether you're on the government side, it makes no difference. We are all United States citizens, and that is our ultimate goal. So again, these pictures too, this is like the official picture, so the, the other pictures were much more attractive. <laughs> So um, a little bit of mom and apple pie to begin. Uh, you know, I did want to uh, state for the record, this is the strategic vision as set out by, uh, by Tony Scott. And I would say um, in Tony Scott, uh, my pleasure in working with him over the last couple of years, um, he set an agenda where he picked a few big ticket items and you constantly hear him say in his speeches, we need to land the plane on these things. We need to pick a few of these and drive them to ground because it's so big and we have so much to tackle uh, that we've got to at least apply focus to a couple of the most critical areas. And I think he chose those very effectively. And as a leader uh, in the IT community, I see that he's driven us towards certain outcomes um, that I don't think would have been achieved if we hadn't had that strong push and that strong leadership. So I would say, as, as my new boss of one month, I certainly um, appreciate uh, the way he has, uh, he has taken that on. It's very hard when you're coming in as a political appointee to make a mark in a very short period of time, and I admire him greatly for that. So the mission of the office in actually executing against his strategic vision is to put together the policy, the planning, the oversight, and the risk management that actually allows the execution of, um, of the agenda within the agencies themselves. And all of our industry partners uh, being knowledgeable and having been there and done that in some of these arenas, and some of you having come from government and gone out to industry, uh, understand the challenges that, you, that we face within the, the bureaucratic nexus in which we all live. There are challenges that are associated with that. But I, you know, I always told my staff, uh, you know, if I ever say we've always done it that way, please show me the door. Because there are always better ways that we can get to the finish line. The four areas that Tony picked to focus on were driving value in federal IT, enabling world-class digital services, protecting our federal assets, and developing the next generation of workforce. And of course, that's really probably uh, the key to the equation because without the people and without the, uh, you know, the creation of that workforce, then absolutely nothing gets done. So how we drive that progress is, is through policy development, uh, implementation guidance, the ability to uh, collect data and track how uh, we are actually performing against the initiatives and how we're going to drive that home. 
and then ultimately um, the oversight. And this is not, I, I kind of hate the word oversight and I really don't like the word compliance. Um, I always have considered uh, in my dealings with, with OMB as well as Congress and GAO and IG uh, that there is value on both sides and that uh, compliance for compliance sake is not what we're seeking. What we're seeking is the ultimate outcome. And that I do believe that we get by working together. The one thing that I wanted to emphasize is, is driving these, uh, these four things down to things that were actually accomplished. So in, in driving uh, value in federal IT, uh, increasing federal IT cost savings, there are a number of initiatives that have been uh, you know, pushed to the finish line over the last few years. One of them that we recently codified in uh, FATARA, and that's the Data Center Consolidation Initiative. Uh, a lot of really solid um, accomplishments that were associated with that initiative. And more importantly, it made us think about, though this originally started with, uh, why don't we just consolidate? Why don't we count numbers? Why don't we talk about the number of data centers and then make less of them, okay? And the answer is not, that's not the right answer anymore. Now we have uh, technologies and cloud computing and, and areas where we can push each individual system to the right environment where it should reside. And I do believe that that's, that's the approach that we're taking now. So we had, sometimes when you set a policy and it's, and it's right at a given time and it marches along the pathway, you understand that the technology or the landscape or the environment changed and you have to tweak the policy and the implementation of it to actually fit what's going on today. And that's what we've done with this particular initiative. Uh, to increase the federal IT projects meeting cost and schedule milestones, uh, this is really uh, that oversight and compliance side of the equation, but I think it's more than that. I think it's uh, the governance side of the equation and making sure that we insert ourselves early enough in the life cycle to actually have an impact on getting projects launched in the right manner and into the right kinds of constructs, particularly agile and, and using those kinds of methodologies where we're doing quick turns and we're giving uh, you know, value to uh, our customers, whether they be internal to an agency or they be a citizen in a rapid fashion and getting feedback on a regular basis. Uh, and we're decreasing legacy IT spending by trying to uh, push ourselves toward modernization. Uh, with digital services, uh, you see a number of things that we're trying to accomplish there, but really what it's about is, is making sure that, um, that people understand what agile methodologies are, that we're able to grow the folks in the development world that can actually uh, perform in this world, and that we are starting to move toward um, you know, those, those rapid turns of delivery that I talked about, and growing that workforce to where that's the preferred methodology for IT delivery over time. That doesn't mean that we don't all maintain and own and currently have, I know I have quite a few within DHS, legacy systems. And we have to be uh, cognizant of how those systems operate, how we might peel the onion and actually um, take aspects of those systems and drive them either towards shared services or uh, enterprise contracts on a sourcing basis or, um, or other methodologies that we might be able to use to, uh, you know, to ratchet down how we're operating in the legacy area and move ourselves toward these newer platforms. That is a very, very difficult task. I don't think people quite understand, and Tony tries to iterate it uh, in every speech that he makes, uh, how difficult that can be. When you're sitting on 20 years worth of COBOL and Fortran, and you're trying to uh, you know, put a front-end web capability you know, in front of that, nobody can tell you what that challenge is like until you've actually lived it. And we need the partnership from the industry to be able to help us drive ourselves to the right-hand side of the equation. Uh, protecting our federal assets, this is all about the cybersecurity arena. Um, I have never been so impressed as with the 30-day um, cyber sprint. I was also exhausted by it. <laughs> and my whole team was exhausted by it. And everybody in, in you know, DHS rallied around the flag and got it done as they did in every agency. But what it did was it said, uh, you know, it got people uh, thinking in terms of, 
of the leadership dynamic, of having the leadership at the top of your organization understand in business terms what it means to be cyber secure and what it means if you're not. And it may have been driven by the OPM breach, but in actuality, um, you can see yourself in that equation. I mean, there isn't any, any uh, entity, not even just government-wide, but also commercially, that is safe uh, these days. And if we don't uh, you know, wake up and smell the coffee and address that, then that's on us. Uh, so we're taking several um, you know, steps to do that. The most recent being uh, the Cybersecurity National Action Plan. Uh, it is very prescriptive. It drives some very key factors, including um, you know, a unified workforce and starting at K through 12. Uh, and I know the Israelis do this. They do it out of necessity. Driving education to include cyber awareness, uh, no matter where you are or what you do. Even if it's in your personal life, even if it's working your phone. Uh, and other disciplines that will be brought into the fray, including um, uh, legal specialists who will actually specialize in cybersecurity, including policy analysts that will you know, specialize in cybersecurity, uh, pulling all of those folks into the equation too. So it's not just about technology. It's about the entirety of, of how we pull all those people together with the right funding models and with the right uh, acquisition approaches to be able to do that. So we're trying to change those along with the equation to actually fit the bill also. <clears throat> Developing the next generation of the IT workforce is absolutely critical. Uh, I spoke about how we're trying to do that in the cyber realm. We're also trying to do that in the uh, realm of uh, agile development and making sure that people understand how to get into uh, that mode of operation. A uh, couple of the last um, aspects of what's out there now, you know, coming attractions. Um, the Data Act has been introduced in the Senate and the House, so it's in process. I don't know how far we'll get or if we'll get to the finish line on that one because we do have a short window, but it's certainly uh, up for, you know, consideration at this point, so it's gotten to that point. On the IT Modernization Fund, uh, those of you who have been reading about that, it's part of, uh, it got promulgated as part of the CNAP, but the IT Modernization Fund is really about not only uh, modernizing your legacy systems so they're cyber secure, but also getting to the point where actually infusing those new technologies that I was talking about. $3.1 billion, the discussion so far, we've had Steny Hoyer is sponsoring it, uh, we also got um, ISA to sponsor it, and I think we had a really good conversation last week with Chaffetz. Uh, so we should be trying to move that needle to the right. Please stay tuned as to how that's progressing, because I think everybody needs to understand what that means, because what we're going to need to execute that is uh, coming together of the acquisition, the financial, and the, and the technology communities uh, to put together cogent business cases where you can tell your story in five pages or less. It's not a CPIC exercise. This is a return on investment, and in our world, that means return on mission. So it's a return on mission, and you better bring some, uh, some chops to the table to be able to talk about how you're going to either use enterprise services, shared services, or uh, common capabilities as, as one of your first plays, and then ultimately, uh, these are going to be uh, our most high-valued assets in the federal government that are going to come to the table. Every agency went through the exercise of identifying their high-value assets based on data and based on uh, their mission. But now we're going to look across, uh, across the entirety of the federal government. And the business cases that are going to resonate with both the board that chooses uh, what goes forward and also with Congress measuring what kind of impact it has are going to be those that can articulate very clearly what the value is uh, to the U.S. citizenry and to the mission space of being able to utilize that money to modernize certain systems. Um, it's a tough road to hoe. We're going to need a lot of support. We're going to need people who are experts in revolving funds. So we're going to need the CFO community in a huge way. And we're going to need people who are experts in acquisition strategies that actually fit Agile. Uh, those are the kinds of things we're looking for. So 
for those of you who support the federal government, um, please bring your, your financial and your acquisition come Padres along, along with your technology knowledge because we're going to need all three. Um, so with that, I'll, um, you know, I'll close out for the networking reception, which I'm standing between you and the cocktails, like I said. Uh, but I'm, I'm really, um, I guess I'm heartened by the fact that, uh, you know, with the implementation of FATARA and all of the, of the large initiatives that we put out there this year, ACT IAC has produced cogent products that have fed into cybersecurity, FATARA implementation, uh, you know, how we do our next generation networks. There are all kinds of, of products that we are putting out there that are truly thought leadership. And I know when I talk to Tony um, these days that he is so uh, grateful for your interaction and your contribution to that. And it's an all volunteer organization. And I know the reason why all of you, as, as well as myself, have decided to give your time and effort, even though it's, it's certainly, uh, you don't have a lot of it, is because you see it actually advancing good government. And that's the reason why we're all here. So I appreciate your, your interaction, and, and I thank you very much for your service. Oh, sure. I'm fine. I can do that. Yeah, that's fine. Ted says I can take some questions. We have about 10 minutes. Folks, have a question or two? Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, round two on FATARA, okay? So uh, the first um, product that we produced on FATARA was the maturity model, and the reason why this was so well received, I think it did pull in all of the CXO suite into the equation and, and helping uh, everybody understand that this was not about the CIO coming forward, though we certainly do need to give the CIO the the authority and the responsibility to execute, execute against, um, against the imperatives that are laid out for CIOs. The, the recognition that it has to be done with, with all the C-suite, the, we do intend to do uh, a round two. Uh, the round two would be you know, going a, a step deeper into some of the maturity aspects and, and getting, uh, I guess, cleaner on the um, you know, examples, templates, products that you could actually use for implementation. Uh, because really, what we're finding, um, we've got all but two of the plans have been approved, and this past uh, Friday was when we were supposed to turn in our progress against the plans, most of which were approved in December. Um, there are challenges because agencies have different organizational structures and they have different governance structures and they have multiple models. And so I think what we need to, um, to put forth as, as an exemplar is how can you actually implement the spirit and the intent of this law within the, the construct of, of your agency as it exists. Now, there's some instances where, you know, we're going to do the Babe Ruth and we're going to go, I'm going to right field and, you know, you're just, you're just in the way, you know. But those are few and far between. I think people actually do, um, I know within DHS, you know, our structure, the CIO does not report to the secretary and will not report to the secretary. It reports to the undersecretary for management. But as long as the CIO is empowered to actually do the things that are outlined in FATARA, have an impact on the budget, actually sign off on the budget, uh, you know, decide what the acquisition strategies should be, sign off on the technology approaches, be a member at the ARB, as long as those things are, are happening and the impact of the CIO on the programs is effective, then we ought to be able to model those in multiple ways. And I think that's probably one of the next things that we can, we can do. We can take that maturity model and we can drive it into what does this mean for you? How does this look like in your space? You know, lessons learned, um, you know, implementation uh, successes and a couple that weren't and how we got around them. Okay. Other questions? The question I have, Margie, is you moved from DHS to OMB. Mm -hmm. It's only been a month. Mm -hmm. Any 
big surprises or aha moments for you? <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't know. Any story like that that you can share? <laughs> um, uh, it, it's different. <laughs> uh, it's extraordinarily different, and um, and and kind of in an interesting way. Uh, I think what we what we see on the receiving end in the agencies is uh, we do have input and they do interact with us on a regular basis to try to ensure that policy uh, you know gets better and when it comes out the other side it's not uh, you know in a state that can't actually be executed. Um, but what I didn't recognize is is all of the of the um, other disciplines that have to go into uh, getting uh, that little piece of paper to actually mean something, like either to get it to the Hill with legislative sla uh, strategy, to get it sponsored by the right people, uh, for an, uh, an executive order, uh, you know, to have something that rises to the level of where it, what it would actually uh, catch the interest of the president and it's good enough government that where he might actually want to codify it in, a, in an executive order, and then the multiple rounds of iterations of getting the language just right because it has to be um, succinct. Uh, you know, it's, it's harder to create something that's, that's shorter and more to the point. And it goes through multiple iterations and through multiple sets of personnel before it can actually be considered a viable product. And that's a machine. It's really a machine. And it's a machine that's been, you know, in place for many years before any of us were born. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, my, um, I'm not shocked by it, but I was surprised by the um, amount of effort and intent that has to go to actually make something, uh, to put, pour concrete over it, you know, to make it so it's actually, um, you know, it's, it's codified and it's actually going to happen. And um, there are many maneuvers and ways that that can get thwarted. And even though I certainly am no stranger to politics, we all deal with them in our organization. And this is politics with a big P. Absolutely. So uh, Ted took my first question, but I had two. So, um, you know, the transition of government that will come up, you know, shortly, it's the first time we've done this in eight years, mm -hmm. in the state of technology engagement of the citizenry and the connectivity and the expectation of engagement is just totally different it than is, eight years yeah. ago. So look into your crystal ball for us and your perspective of now being at OMB and having been in an agency. What do you wish or what do you hope transition can look like and you know I'm, I'm excited about this groups being able to be part of that yeah working on the presidential paper uh, that we're working on right now is just is so key uh, to getting our voice into the equation what I what I would hope uh, and I think I'm not totally out of bounds in, in, in hoping for this um, I think it's probably pretty achievable is uh, when you look at at uh, our world, um, except for privacy issues, you know, people uh, can end up on opposite sides of the spectrum on that. A lot of what we're talking about here is what I would call uh, device agnostic. Um, it's, it's about, um, you know, best business practices. It's about uh, the right way to deliver IT. It's about having, uh, you know, a mission impact on a program and enabling it through technology. Uh, it's about serving our citizens. And I don't think those are things that, that are R or D. They're just things that are about, uh, you know, doing the right thing. And I think if we all stay centered on that, and I believe that the kinds of things that we're bringing forward um, in our paper, our transition paper, and there are other organizations that are working in that vein too. And we're all kind of converging on the same things. If you notice that, I know that... Uh, Ken has been talking with Partnership for Public Service. We're, we're very connected to them also. Uh, other people that are, are working on these kinds of, of transition inputs. We all have ended up centering on, on kind of the same things, which tells you they're probably the right things, and which tells you they're probably things that, that most people wouldn't 
argue with implementing. You can change the marquee name, you can call it by a different program, you know, moniker, you can brand it differently, which I'm sure will happen. But but the basics of, of you know, should we protect against bad state actors in cyberspace, that's not gonna change. There are certain things that are, are kind of uh, bedrock, foundational, um, that we will just, until somebody tells me to stop, I'm just gonna keep moving. And uh, I know people always ask you, oh, now you're going into the, the silly season, uh, you know, when you get into election time and, and, you know, everybody's just kind of sitting back. I do not see that at all. I see everybody going all the way to the finish line, and especially in my, my new role, I see everybody in, in that organization marching to the finish line to make sure that whatever's on this president's agenda gets solidified. And um, that's, that's usually what you see in transition. Uh, in agencies, I know that we were ginning up uh, in DHS to, uh, to be prepared to be able to, uh, you know, articulate our, our mission in life and, and to bring that to a new leader, new set of leaders, whoever they may be. So those of us who are career feds understand that, um, that you can either be the person who sits back and kind of warms the chair, or you can be the person who just keeps moving. And I think most, most of the people I know choose to just keep moving until somebody tells them to stop. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Got it. Thank you very much, Margie. That, that was really great. And we'll look forward to hearing more and more as you continue in that role. Um, that wraps up our formal program uh, as the, as the the sign says up front, we're going to move into our networking reception. Uh, again, I want to thank all the candidates for coming. I want to thank everybody who participated and thank the great I ACT IAC staff for putting this on again. So we'll, we'll see you all out in the hallway and we'll see you all at the next, the next events. <laughs>